In verses 5 through 7, it talks about the privilege of prayer. That sometimes I think, and, and this is true for me as well, that when prayer, then that when there are no hindrances to prayer, we forget what a great privilege it is. In verse 5, he says, For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's the heart of it. Uh, sometimes, well, every time, when I get ready to marry a couple, they're, they've come to me and they want to get married. And so we'll sit down and have our first conversation and I have some guidelines that I share with them. And I say, you know, as a couple, for me to marry you, that you both need to have a faith in Jesus Christ. And they say, yeah, okay. So I said, one of the things I'm going to do in our first session is just walk you through an understanding of the gospel. And so what I do is I have this little track, this little pamphlet, and I put that in front of them so that they can both see what we're talking about. And it talks about God and who He is and His holiness and His perfection. Then it describes man and how in Adam and Eve we sin, and then you and I have come along and we've sinned too. And what that did, it opens up this big canyon between us. Uh, I, I say in our country, it's the Grand Canyon. In, in Arizona, in the southwestern United States, we have this massively wide canyon. It's very wide and it's very deep. And I said, there is a spiritual Grand Canyon that separates a holy God from a sinful man. There's no way that we can get from our side to God's side. Someone had to step in and help. And I said, that was Jesus Christ. And so usually the picture in the pamphlet is drawn as a cross and it becomes a bridge from one side to the other. And I said, Jesus Christ spans that gap from one side to the other. He becomes our mediator. He stands in the gap for us. And He gives us the privilege not only to know Him, but to be in communication with Him. He is our mediator. He mediates between a holy God and a sinful people who now have an opportunity to be in relationship with God. I, I think of the the Old Testament man, Job. If you know his story at all, God allowed all kinds of horrific things to happen to him. Satan had come to God one day and, says, and God says, have you noticed my servant Job? He's, he's really an outstanding man. And Job said, or Satan said, well, of course he's going to follow you. You've given him so many things. And God says, well, I'll let you take some of those things away. Satan does. Job continues his relationship with God. Satan comes back and he says, let me take some more. God says, you can take anything except don't take his life. He gets boils all over his body. He's in torturous pain uh, every hour of every day, and he's laying in a pile of ashes, and he's just kind of existing. And even his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job said, hey, he, he gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then Job's friends come and talk to him and, and they kind of say, well, Job, there must be some sin in your life and you must have done something wrong. And, and Job kind of gets offended by that. And over the process of these conversations, he begins to get a little defensive and he says, you know, if only I had someone to speak for me, if only God would come down here and talk to me, if only I could speak to him, I would explain my story and he would vindicate me, he would justify me. If you know the story of Job, at the end of the story, God does speak to him and Job, God says to Job, Hey Job, where were you when I, and he lists all kinds of things. Job, where were you when I created this? Where were you when I did this? And all Job could say is, Lord, I spoke of things I had no clue about. So that centuries later when Jesus Christ came, he became the mediator between a holy God and a sinful person that Job was looking for an advocate or a mediator, Jesus Christ became that mediator to bridge that gap that we have between a holy God and a sinful people. And you say, well, what does that have to do with prayer? There is one God, there is one mediator between God and the man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. See, the thing that, I, that instructs me about this verse and prayer and the mediator is this. There are some religious systems that have priests. Maybe some of you grew up in a system of a priestly order. And there are certain religions like that in America and, and around the Western world. And the thing about that that bothers me is not necessarily that it's so wrong as it's just so unnecessary. That, that we don't need a priest 
for us to talk to the priest who then talks to God, he says, because of Jesus Christ, he is our high priest, that we have an advocate with the Father, that we can speak directly to him. Verse 7, for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Timothy, this is what it's all about. You are here to tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have a chance to pray to the God of the universe who created everything, who is sovereign over all and through all and in all. We can pray for our leaders. We can pray for our people because God wants everyone to be saved. And Timothy, the person we pray to is this fantastic mediator between God and man. He is, our, he is the one who speaks for us. He works in and through us. He says, Timothy, that's not only the priority of prayer, that's the privilege of prayer. I think that one of the, the problems I have with prayer is that I often forget what a privilege it is to speak to God in prayer. That so many times we take it for granted because we can talk to God anytime, any place, anywhere. We forget what an amazing privilege it is to talk to this God in this way. Well, the one thing I want you to see in, these, in this last verse then is the posture of prayer in verse 8 when he talks directly to man and he says this, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or without quarreling. I like that admonition to men. He's not saying that women can't pray. He's not saying that women shouldn't pray. He's looking at men and saying, listen, I have appointed you to be leaders in your home. And you men of all people, I expect that you would pray. And the posture of prayer, he says, I want you to lift holy hands. When your hands are open and upraised to God, he says, that is an expression of my dependence upon you. It is my openness before you. Now, I, I grew up in a, and I'm not saying that we literally have to pray with our hands upraised. I grew up in a tradition that was very, what, shall, what should my word be, very conservative, very stoic, where we didn't, we didn't show any expression. So we were just very serious, and we prayed seriously. And so if someone would ever come to our church and hold up hands, we'd go, whoa, what's wrong with him? Why is he doing that? And we look at a verse like this, say, oh, does that mean that every time men should pray, they should literally lift up their hands? I don't think he's saying literally lift up your hands. He's saying this is an expression, this is an illustration of our openness before God. When Sasha was younger, and she's only eight years old now, but when she was three or four years old, I would come home from church and I would come in the back door of our home, I would hang up my coat, and I would either hear this little pitter-patter and her steps coming, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. She would come to me and she would turn and she would raise her hands to me. And what did that mean? Daddy, pick me up. Hold me up, Daddy. And she's so little and she was so tiny. I could pick her up and I could throw her up in the air and she would laugh and she would giggle because she felt perfectly safe. But when she would lift up her hands to me, she was saying, take me, hold me, make me feel safe. Let me know that you love me. Because here I am, this is who I am, I am your daughter. I, I think that's part of what this expression of lifting up hands to God is, is, is we, like a child, going to God and say, God, here I am, take me, hold me, keep me safe, please. Let me know that you're always gonna take care of me, that everything is gonna be just fine, everything is gonna be just okay, even though all my circumstances around me are very difficult, as long as I can look to you I know that my faith and my dependence and my trust is solid and secure and everything is going to be okay. Does, does that make sense to you? And he says, man, I want you to have that kind of attitude. He says, holy hands, not dirty hands, not corrupted hands, but holy is the word for separated for sacred service. Lord, my hands are for you. Lord, I'm sorry that sometimes my actions don't reflect how holy and godly you are but I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your sanctification. I thank you for your justification and your righteousness. And so based on what you have done for me, I lift my hands. You have made me holy. We're not saying that we're perfect. We're not saying that everything is, is in perfect order. We're saying, but this is who I am before you. 
He says, I want you to lift holy hands without anger, without quarreling. He says, you know, how can we come to God in a state of anger or where we've been quarreling with our brother or our sister in Christ? So we've been fighting and we've been having this squabble and we've been having this squabble over here. Oh God, it's really nice to talk to you again. Then we start fighting over here again. See, I think what he's implying is that if our vertical relationship with God is good, it's going to affect our horizontal relationship with other people. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Remember how we introduced the idea yesterday of belief drives behavior? That what we believe about God affects what we believe about ourselves, what we believe about the world, and that affects how we live. That when we believe God is holy and we're having a chance to talk to the God of the universe, we say, Lord, here I am. This is who I am. And instead of coming to God quarreling and fighting, I, I sometimes laugh and, and groan at the same time. Our family prayer times are sometimes very interesting opportunities. Um, because of the, the diverse age of our children, from 16 down to 8, they're at different stages of life. And so it's hard to gather all of the children and Trudy and I together to pray. But on, on occasion, we'll be able to do that. And it's, it's nighttime and it's bedtime. And so we gather everyone in a room to pray. And what's funny and sad about it is that maybe the boys are fighting with each other. He touched me. He pushed me. Well, it's his fault, or he did this, and they're arguing, and they say, and it's your turn to pray. And when it comes turn to their prayer, and they've been arguing and they've been fighting, and they went, no, 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 it's your turn to pray. And dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the sleep. Help me to do good on my test tomorrow. And I go, you were just fighting with your brother. How do you pray a prayer like that? And while we laugh at our children, I mean, we don't laugh at our children, but when we laugh at that example, how many times are we having problems with people in our churches or people in our homes? And that gets, and yet we turn to God and pray, Lord, everything is fine. Thank you. Good. Please help me today. Good. Thank you. Amen. Paul says, I want the man to take the lead. See, so one of the problems that we have in America is men have begun to just slip slowly into the background. And thankfully, there are godly women around who are, are, are raising up and her, who are taking their Christian responsibilities seriously. And I think Paul's words in the first century, we need desperately in our nation and probably in our world today. God says, men, I have placed you in a place of responsibility. Now let's get to work. Men, you are responsible for your homes. You are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. You are to raise your children in the discipline and the admonition of the Lord. Now do it. And your children need to see that you as fathers in your homes pray. See, my hope is that when my children see their dad pray, they don't think that it's the pastor praying, that it's their dad praying. That one day when they are husbands and wives in their homes, they will become for their wives and husbands and children what I tried to model for them. I am not a perfect example. I don't come with the right attitude all the time. But I'm always living with the notion that I am responsible for my family to provide a godly example. And I don't always do a great job. And when I don't, I confess that to them and I say, kids, I'm sorry, I messed up. Sometimes my children will say, Dad, why, why are you so stressed out? And I say, well, I got this to do and that to do. And I go, how did you know I was stressed out? I was trying not to let you know. Say, Dad, we can, we can see it. We can tell. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Prayer is one of the greatest privileges we have. It's one of the greatest responsibilities we have. Our posture in prayer can take any one of a number of forms. We can sit and pray. 
We can kneel and pray. We can, sometimes I lay flat out on the ground and pray. And as Paul says, whether you take it literally or just as our standing before God, well, what I want you to do is have a relationship with God that is open and honest and dependent upon God that says, here I am, please use me for your glory today. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10-11 How to give to TVS Ministry You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.